And yeah, take it away, Rick. Yes, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for this introduction and also uh, for this opportunity to tell a little bit about, a little bit about uh, some of the work uh, I did during my PhD before I moved here. So the talk today um, is going to be about, well, Brownian motion in Riemannian manifolds, but also it's more of, of um, a certain approach of, of defining stochastic processes in, in manifolds uh, in general. Uh, where Brownian motion is then uh, one of the, uh, the prototypical examples of such a stochastic process. Um, but before we really go into this, uh, I first want to uh, tell a little bit more about uh, what really my background is and my motivation to study these kind of processes and also the way they are uh, constructed. Um, so I have really a probabilistic uh, background and I'm mainly into uh, large deviations for stochastic, for stochastic uh, for random variables. And uh, to tell a little bit more what these are, uh, that is large deviations are concerned with uh, asymptotic behavior of uh, a sequence of random variables. Um, think for example of, of coin flips. Uh, then of course, um, if I do a lot of coin flips and the coin is fair, I, I uh, expect the, um, the fraction of heads to be approximately a half. Um, and that's what we call the law of large numbers behavior that, that really the, the average over a lot of uh, uh, copies of this random variable are, is going to be approximately the expectation, uh, uh, what we are expecting. And that's also the scale on which we are looking. So we call deviations large if they are deviations on this law of large number scale. So, so for the, the example with the heads and tails, uh, what you could think about is that, um, of course, this fraction has to be close to a half, but you could wonder what the probability is that the fraction of heads is, for example, um, maybe twice as high as the fraction of tails or more. Uh, and then this is a, an event that is called a large deviation. Uh, and such events typically have exponentially small probabilities. And the whole point is that we try to quantify these, these small probabilities. So intuitively, we can write that as follows. Uh, we say that uh, a sequence Xn satisfies a large deviation principle. If the probability that our, our random variables are near some some point x decays exponentially in n with a certain rate. And this rate depends on the point x. Uh, and usually it's then also the idea that you try to, to find a nice formula for this rate function uh, to have some more uh, information. And now my, um, my work in this area is mainly to uh, find analogs of classical results in large deviations, uh, but then in Riemannian manifolds. And some classical results uh, in large deviations are, for example, uh, Kramer's theorem. So that's about, uh, about random walks. So um, if, whenever I talk about the sum of random variables, I see it as a random walk because what actually, what, do, what does it do? Well, each time I add, uh, a random, uh, add an xi, I kind of move from one point to the other. And that's why I, I would refer to these objects as random walks. Uh, and then Kramer's theorem tells us the large deviation behavior of such, uh, of such objects. And you see, you can actually compute the rate function here in terms of the, uh, the moment generating function, what they call the, of, the, uh, of the increments of your random walk. So really there is a nice expression uh, uh, for this. Uh, but these are discrete, um, processes, discrete random variables. You can also think of continuous time processes such as Brownian motion. And also for these, you can do large deviations. So if you take a Brownian trajectory and you scale it by square root n, uh, then typically this goes to zero. Uh, so to the zero trajectory, but the probability that it finds itself around some certain trajectory gamma actually decays exponentially in N and the rate is given by the action of the trajectory. So there is really some, some kind of physical interpretation here of, of the rate function of a, of a trajectory uh, occurring. Uh, so these are some of the, the, the classical results from, from probability fear from large deviations that, well, that I have been studying uh, in Riemannian manifolds. Uh, 
uh, and we will get to, uh, back to this later uh, when we uh, went, went over the construction for, for example, Brownian motion. Okay, um, so now uh, the main goal of the next part or of the next few parts is to, to figure out how to define and construct a Brownian motion in a manifold. Um, but in order to do this, of course, it might be good to have a look at how what Brownian motion actually is in Euclidean space. And if we can somehow find certain properties or uh, definitions that can be used to also in Riemannian manifolds. So the standard way of defining Brownian motion um, is that it is a process that has independent increments, which means that if I take two time intervals, which are disjoint, and I look at how with what jump Brownian motion makes across this time interval, then those two jumps are independent of one, one another. And actually you can let the time intervals uh, touch on one, one boundary, that's fine. But you see that, that jumps in the future are somehow independent of jumps in the past. Um, furthermore, we also know the distribution of such, such increments. So if we have the, the increment over a time interval of length t minus s, then it, this has a normal distribution with mean zero and variance t minus s. And finally, we want the trajectories to be continuous. So it has to be a continuous process. Now you could, well, start with the question, is this a suitable definition to generalize to, uh, to a manifold? And then there are, well, there is one big issue here to try to, to uh, um, find the analog of this in a manifold, and that's those differences, those increments. Because if, if for example, those points, of course, maybe are, are points on the sphere, then there's really no good way of defining what the difference between those two points is going to be. Um, so this seems not really suitable to, um, to extend to, uh, to a manifold uh, setting. So then it might be good to um, have a look at some other properties of Brownian motion uh, that might be uh, more of use to us uh, in this case. So the first uh, idea that, that one could try is uh, to approximate Brownian motion by random walk, so by kind of discrete processes. Um, and uh, if we only look at, at uh, random variables for now and not entire trajectories, uh, then we have the following result, namely that if we have a sequence of, of IID, the independent and identically distributed random variables with a mean zero and variance of one, then we have the central limit theorem, which says that if we divide the sum of the xi by square root n, then there is still some randomness left, but this randomness goes to a standard normal distribution. And the idea is now that also uh, you can do this on a level of trajectories, and then actually the, the, what we call the invariance principle is kind of the analog of the central limit theorem, but then for trajectories, for entire paths. So what you do is you consider the path uh, of this random walk until time t, what this means is that you say, okay, I, I sum n times t of the increments, um, and that gives me a number of dots that form the entire trajectory. And each dot represents one of the, the n jumps that, that the process makes. And then the invariance principle tells us that this converges to a Brownian motion. So the distribution of this object comes closer and closer to the distribution of a Brownian motion. Um, and this can of course be one way of, of obtaining a Brownian motion also in a manifold, as long as one can define random walks. Um, and this is actually possible, but we will really use this, this as a property of Brownian motion that we, uh, we are going to obtain. Uh, and there is, a, there is one more uh, property also in already in Euclidean space, which is even more useful to us at this moment. Uh, and that we're going to next. So also, please, if there's something unclear, if I go too quickly or too slow, you can interrupt me, by the way. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's fine. So what you can do to define stochastic processes or more precisely Markov processes, so processes where 
the future and the past are independent of one, of one another as long as you are given the present. So, so somehow it only matters how I got there. It doesn't matter. Uh, it, it only matters where I am. It doesn't matter how I got there if, in order for me to know how to continue. Um, you can define an operator associated to such processes and that's called the transition operator. And this might seem a little bit, um, well, mysterious at first, why I would uh, look at this uh, operator, but um, keep in mind that I can use it to find uh, transition probabilities of my, to find transition probabilities of my Brownian motion. Because the probability that I start, uh, that I end up in a set A, given that I start in X, in X, I can compute this as exactly the expectation of the indicator function of, of the set A. Uh, because this is exactly one, of course, on the set A and zero elsewhere. So you get exactly the mass uh, of this set, which is, which is the probability uh, that this set occurs. And this you can find by means of this transition operator. So that's why it's really a, an, an operator that's important for such Markov processes. And because the process is Markov and, and the, the increments are, are stationary, so it only matters how far, uh, how long they, uh, the, the time interval is over which we jump, and it doesn't matter where we are. Uh, you can actually show that this is a semi-group. Um, and such semi-groups you can study um, by their infinitesimal behavior. And that's in a way the time derivative of the semi-group at zero. And you can show <laughs> that uh, this uh, is exactly given by the second derivative. So what this kind of tells us is that the infinitesimal behavior of a Brownian motion is somehow explained by the, the, the second derivative operator. And one, one way of seeing this, or at least making this viable, that, that this, this could be the case, but it's by no means a proof, is, is the following. So what you can do is you can write down the, the, um, the density function of a standard nor of a normal distribution with mean zero and variance t. And now if you would compute the time derivative of this thing and the second derivative in space, you will see that they, those are indeed equal. So like I say, this is by no means a proof of the fact that, that really the, the generator of Brownian motion is the second derivative. It at least makes it viable that, that this will be the case. Uh, and I think for now that that, that is sufficient uh, for us. And of course, if you go to higher dimensions, you might be able to guess what then the generator is going to be. And that's going to be exactly the Laplace operator. And that's a fact that we are uh, really going to use to define Brownian motion in manifolds. So that leads us to, uh, to the definition of Brownian motion. Uh, and like, we've, like I said, if we have uh, a Laplacian, then we can define a Brownian motion that somehow is generated by this operator. Uh, but to have a Laplacian uh, on a manifold, you actually need some additional structure. You namely need a Riemannian metric. And um, <laughs> a Riemannian metric, I will recap. Um, I, I don't know if, if anyone is familiar, but I'll recap shortly. So a Riemannian metric is actually kind of gives you an inner product on each tangent space. Um, and it has to depend smoothly uh, on X, which you can, can visualize in, in, in uh, various ways. You can say, okay, I look at, at, at just a small patch of my manifold and I compute it in local coordinates. And then, and then an inner product is essentially given by a matrix. And then you can say, okay, the, the entries of this matrix, matrix have to, be, have to uh, depend smoothly on X. Or another way could be to say, okay, I, if I have two vector fields on, on M, then their inner product has to be a smooth function on, on the manifold, for example. These are ways of thinking about this. And just to show shortly that uh, you can define a Laplacian, the so-called laplace Beltrami operator, is that it can be given in local coordinates. Uh, I'm usually not a fan of, of writing formulas or such annoying formulas in, in, in presentations. 
But the, mainly what I want to highlight is that it's indeed, uh, it looks like a second order differential operator. So you have a first derivative here and you apply a second derivative afterwards. And in coordinates, like I said, we, we, look, we view G as a matrix so we can find its determinant easily. And those, the GIJs uh, with, with uppercase IJ, uh, those are the entries of the inverse matrix. So what I really want to, to say with this is that, that it's possible to define a Laplace, but a Laplace operator in a Riemannian manifold and that it really depends on this Riemannian metric. And now, of course, we, are, we have a Laplacian, so this, this delta M, and that gives us the possibility to define uh, a Brownian motion as the continuous process generated by this operator. <laughs> And that's mainly the definition we're going to use. So that's the way that we can we can uh, get our hands on on uh, stochastic processes. But as we have seen, and and I didn't tell this for for nothing, of course, is that we can also approximate such processes by uh, by random walks if we suitably rescale them. And that I want to talk a little bit more now. Uh, so, Rick, maybe before yes. you get there, or maybe you will say, but can you say a bit more about how you construct Brownian motion from the Laplacian? again because i don't think i really understood I mm, let me see uh, is there a good way to uh, to explain this uh, so like like what, what at least how i have it in mind is mainly that that i use this this laplacian mainly to figure out what the transition uh, density is going to be so uh, uh, let me see if I go back uh, to this. So, so <clears throat> what you can do is you can, and now I have to be careful how to uh, say this correctly. Um, so so this, this derivative uh, gives you the, 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 the behavior uh, of, of this uh, semi-group. And, and from there, you go back to the, uh, to the transition density. So I think that that's kind of the best way to, to explain it, how you would go from the, given with what I told, uh, how you would go from the, uh, the generator back to the, the process. Um, and, and I must admit that, that it's not, if you really want, want an algorithm that constructs the Brownian motion, then, then what I'm going to tell next is, is, uh, is certainly uh, more useful. This is in a way more a theoretical tool to study the process. So it, it, it gives you the possibility to get your hands on the transition kernel, for example. So the, the transition probabilities of the process. Uh, but I'm not sure if it's really very helpful to, to, to construct it practically. So I don't know if that, that uh, is a satisfactory answer at this point. No, no, th yeah, thanks, no, no worries. I mean, also, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the random walk kind of mm -hmm. approach. So. So I must, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so really the random walk approach, I think also one of the more uh, useful uh, constructions to really define the process that somehow you look at very small steps uh, and you kind of pretend that, that, that it, on, on that scale, it's just sufficient to do it like this. Uh, so let's, let, let's go to that point. So um, the idea of, the random, of a random walk is, is as follows. Um, so what we do is we start at some point on the sphere and then we um, consider a tangent vector there and then we want to walk in the direction of this tangent vector for a while essentially for for time one because we want to add the entire tangent vector to our walk and we do this by following the geodesic because that's somehow the the, the, the line that goes constantly in the direction of x1 and then we do the same here. We take a tangent vector and we follow the geodesic and we keep repeating this. And that gives us a random walk uh, on a manifold. And we refer to this as a geodesic random walk because well, yeah, we follow geodesics one after the other. Uh, and of course, we have seen with this invariance principle, if you recall that, that along the way, uh, or at some point, we also have to rescale the process by one over square root n to, to, to get to something that is 
uh, going towards a normal distribution or if you look at the entire path would, would be close to a Brownian motion. And what we do here is we don't rescale uh, the process because that would, wouldn't be really possible. We rescale the tangent vectors. So we can rescale the tangent vectors by one over square root n to get similar behavior. Now, another observation that you have to make is that, of course, because I move over my manifold, I have to sample from a different tangent space each time. So I need to have a way of doing this at every, every tangent space. So I need to have a probability distribution on, on every tangent space. <laughs> and now um, there's going to be one issue because also for the central limit theorem type of results, uh, the, the increments of your random walks have to be identically distributed. But in this case, they live in different spaces. So it's a bit hard to, to say what it really means to be to have the same distribution. And we're going to do this as follows. So essentially, if you're in a manifold and you want to kind of compare tangent vectors at different points, one of the, the best ways of doing this is by parallel transport. You, so you, you take your vector and you keep it somehow parallel to your surface, uh, or, or you keep it constant in, in moving it from one point to the other. And that gives you an identification between two, two tangent spaces. But the only problem is that this actually depends on the curve you choose to connect two points. Um, you can see this, for example, on a sphere. If you, for, if you either take an entire loop around the sphere or you stop at the equator and then make like a triangle back, if you would try to carry this out, you see that somehow orientation has changed and that's all due to curvature. <coughs> So what we do is instead we assume that uh, this consistency so this identification holds or well they have the same distribution under this identification under any possible way of parallelly transporting between two uh, points and this mi this might sound like a very very strong assumption but but it's really uh, yeah, it's really necessary. You, you have seen many constructions. Uh, you see it coming back that, that you need it, for example, uh, in something I will tell later, uh, it turns out that you need it to, to keep some, some processes uh, Markov, for example, uh, which is very important. Um, so it's a very strict uh, assumption, but luckily there are plenty of, of, of examples. So mainly, uh, distributions which are, for example, invariant under all kinds of rotations, th those work, uh, work very well. Uh, so with this at hand, we can now define the invariance or, or uh, state the invariance principle. So we can consider this random walk we were doing uh, with scaled steps where we scale by one over square root n. Uh, and then we again look at this at the point, the whole process of points uh, that, that we, we trace out like this. And one can show that this process actually converges to a Riemannian Brownian motion, really with this as generator, this, this Laplace Beltrami operator. And now, this, of course, is, is well, a lot easier, I think, to, to for example, sample. Uh, <clears throat> Um, a sample from so so in the end of course you 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 can choose your step size this this n uh, or one over square one over n say so you can make this as fine as possible and then the, the 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 process comes ever closer to a Brownian motion that you that you wish to study <coughs> so for for really construction purposes this is uh, this is a more useful uh, approach and this has been proved by by uh, Jurgensen already like I think 40 years 40 something years ago uh, but I think it's very useful to, to have, have this at hand. Um, but this is not the main construction that I want to talk about today. And the, and the, the one I want to, to um, spend most of, of the talk on today um, is a certain geometric construction of a Riemannian Brownian motion, which I think is, is very interesting also in other uh, scenarios where it's very useful. Uh, so what we are going to do is that we're going to try to do the following. So 
instead of trying to define immediately a Brownian motion on the manifold, we are going to try and see if we can take a Brownian motion in RD, so in flat space, and somehow paste this onto the manifold or transfer this to the manifold. So you could, for example, uh, imagine that I have a Brownian motion on the plane and I have a sphere and I would somehow try to, to see if I can uh, make it work that I can transfer this Brownian motion in flat space onto the sphere. And how we're going to do this is as follows. So what you can do is you can say, okay, I take my sphere and I roll it along the Brownian motion and then this traces a certain curve on the manifold. And the idea is then that, that the imprint on the manifold you get, uh, that that's really going to be a Brownian motion on M like we defined it. Uh, <coughs> and that's what I want to, to talk with you today about, like, like how can you make this, this ID mathematically a little bit more rigorous? And I can imagine that is, well, it, it's, it's not an easy construction for sure. So I'll try to take you through it like step by step and, 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 and slowly. Um, but the idea is as follows. So we actually want to go from RD, so from our plane to the sphere, to, to our manifold. But actually the opposite direction is a little bit easier to start with. And I think it's important to do this to, to kind of understand what's going on. So the idea is as follows, if we roll our manifold over, uh, over our plane, over our D, then what you see is that somehow the, the tangent vectors of the two curves that, that we, we, we are considering, those have to kind of agree in a way. Um, so the idea is that we somehow have to translate the, uh, the tangent vector of our curve gamma in, in M to yeah, a, a, a vector in our D. And how we're going to do this as as follows. Well, what we can do is we can say, okay, we take a basis of the tangent space and then we transfer our tangent vector to our D by giving it, by making the vector just the, the vector of coordinates of, of our tangent vector in this basis that we are given. That is one way of doing it. And such a basis for, for the tangent space, we are going to refer to as frames because we're going to, to view it as a map or isomorphism from RD to the tangent space. And why can we do this? Well, if we take a basis of RD, then if we look at the image of this basis, then this is going to be a basis of the tangent uh, space. <coughs> And vice versa, because U is going to be a linear map, it actually suffices to, to, to define its image on some set of basis vectors. But this, this frame uh, concept, that, that's like how they usually define it. So, so let me also do it like that. So now what we are going to do is we have our curve gamma and we can select on every point, we can select such a frame, such a basis for the tangent space. And what this does for us is that at every point along gamma, we can translate the, uh, the derivative or the tangent vector of gamma to a vector in RD. So that what we do here, we can of course use this map U to go from RD to the tangent space, but we can also use it to go back and then what we want to have our, our curve in RD to satisfy is that exactly it is a curve with this derivative. So, so with this uh, identification between the derivatives that we have now made. And because we, can, we are in RD, we can simply integrate to obtain a curve, uh, a curve in RD, which we can call the one that we would associate to our curve gamma. But for now, there's really a lot of choice uh, left in this construction because essentially I have said nothing about the way that we are choosing our frames. For now, you could still have made any possible choice that you would like and, and you end up with such a, such a curve W. And the idea is now to put a little bit more uh, restrictions on, on what kind of curve U we can choose. <coughs> so, the idea is that in our trans in, in our in the process of transferring these curves, 
we kind of don't want to have any external influences. So we already had the influence of the, the, um, the tangent of the curve. And now we want to see what, how the curvature is going to influence this and only the curvature. So no, no uh, uh, external forces. And what the idea then is, is that somehow the frames have to remain the same along this curve gamma. Uh, but then of course, it are frames for different spaces. So you cannot keep them literally the same. But we have seen it also with the construction of, of uh, or random walks that what we then do is try, okay, we at least can keep them parallel along, uh, along the curve. And how can you, for example, define, well, the parallel transport of a frame is just saying, okay, I take a set of basis vectors, I transport those parallelly, and then I, I have essentially transported my entire frame because then I can express the rest of the frame in terms of this basis. <clears throat> and now in this case, if, if this happens, so if our frames are chosen parallel, then we call UT a horizontal curve or more specifically the horizontal lift of gamma. This is going to be more uh, important later. And the curve W is the so-called anti-development. And you should think of this as, okay, I'm, I'm essentially trying to develop a curve in RD onto the manifold, but this is kind of the reverse process. So that's why they call it anti-development, I think. Um, so this is a way of transferring curves on M, in, on M to curves in RD. And the most important ingredient along the way is that we have frames that identify our tangent spaces with RD. And that's what we are go also going to use for the opposite direction, that if we can try to get our hands on such a set of frames. Because if we now start with a curve W in RD, then it's not necessarily immediately clear how, how we can get, uh, get our hands on such a collection of frames. Because before we could say, okay, we start with a given frame. I mean, we have to have some information and then we could transport this parallelly along the curve and we would have our entire set of frames. But now we don't have any base points where our frames are attached to. So the problem is a little bit that a frame U, a frame U also essentially immediately encodes a base point in the manifold where it has to be attached to. Um, so we now have to kind of figure out two, two curves in one go from W. Um, but it's actually not too much of an issue because we have also other, uh, other problems where you try to study base points and objects uh, to, uh, to, together. For example, if we look at vector fields, that's kind of the same thing, but then for tangent vectors, uh, where also the base point is, is hidden in the tangent vector in some way. So what we can uh, do is we can say, okay, I just look at every point at all at the set of all possible frames that I can have at that point for the tangent space and I bundle all those together uh, much like you would define the tangent bundle of a manifold you can also define the so-called frame bundle <coughs> and this is again a manifold so you can you can talk about what it means for example what it means to be tangent vectors and these kind of things so that's what we are going to do so if you look at this, this frame bundle, you, you can see the points are essentially consisting of two parts. So you have a base point in M and you have a frame for the tangent space there. Um, and this means that you can kind of distinguish beti between two, two directions. You, namely, you can namely consider curves which keep the base point fixed, but change the curve around, change the frame around. And those we will refer to as vertical curves. And the other ones, I already uh, mentioned the, the name already, that the other ones are going to be horizontal curves. And that are curves where you, yeah, you want to kind of only change the base point, but we have already seen that that's not possible, changing the base point and keeping the frame fixed. So we have to take the frame along and we do this again parallelly. So curves where the frame moves parallel along the curve of base points in, in M, that we call horizontal curves. 
And often, uh, as I've already done a little bit before, maybe if I talk about frames, I usually, or it, it, it's usually done that you suppress the base point where it's attached to. Uh, but for now, I really showed, showed, let it show up to, to, to make sure that, that we really understand that we not only are trying to define U, but also have to kind of keep in mind that we are defining gamma. <clears throat> So when we were going from, from M to RD, we chose our, our frames U to be parallel along the curve gamma. So what this means is that we chose a horizontal curve of frames. Um, and that's what we're going to use now. We're trying to go and reconstruct from our curve W a horizontal curve of frames, which would then lead, if we project it down to the manifold, so if we only look at the base points, that would give us uh, the curve that we want to associate to W. So how we are going to do this is that we are going to define hor vector fields only consisting of horizontal vectors. So very um, inspiring, we call a vector, a tangent vector at, at, on, on FM, we call it horizontal if it's tangent to a horizontal curve. Uh, and now the claim is that we can use a single uh, vector in RD to identify a whole vector field on, on FM consisting of horizontal vectors. Uh, and this is what is going to help us out if we want to translate somehow the tangent of the curve in uh, the curve W in RD to tangent vectors of our horizontal curve U. Because this, this is exactly the identification that we're going to need. So then, of course, the question is, is how, are, how are we going to do this? Because it seems like a lot to ask that, that we can, can just use a single vector in our D2 to, to construct the whole vector field on this frame bundle. But we're going to do this as follows. So we start with, with our vector in our D and, and a frame uh, U at the point X. <clears throat> then if we apply u to e, then we get a tangent vector at x because that was our definition of u. Uh, now what you can do is you can say, okay, I, I can consider a curve uh, that goes through x uh, with exactly tangent vector ue. Uh, and then this is a curve for which we can uh, consider a horizontal lift. So a set of horizontal frames along this curve curve where we start with the frame U. So in zero, in, in gamma zero, we set the frame U and we parallelly transport this along gamma. And this gives me a horizontal curve because, but by construction, because we took it to be uh, parallel uh, along gamma. And then the, uh, the derivatives, the tangent vector of this curve, that's going to be a horizontal vector. Uh, and that's exactly the horizontal vector we're going to need. So this maybe seems like a lot, but, but I hope that like breaking down the steps, how you, you start with a vector and a frame, how you go to a tangent vector, I hope this, this makes it a little bit clearer. So now we are going to, of course, use this identification, but we replace E by a suitable vector defined from our curve W. So what we want to do is we, we, we want to relate the derivative of our curve W to the derivative of the uh, the, the frames, uh, the curve of frames U by exactly this procedure. So we, we say, okay, the derivative of U is going to be H at the frame U applied to the, the, the derivative of W. And this gives you a differential equation that you can solve. And the solution is, is, is going to give you a horizontal, uh, a horizontal curve, which when you project down, gives you a curve in M. And this is what we call the development of, of W onto the manifold. Uh, oh. <clears throat> and this, uh, this seems like a lot that's going on, but I think that the, the best thing you, you should try to keep in mind from this is that somehow we are trying to relate curves in RD to curves in M. And the way we do this is by trying to relate their tangent vectors and this we do via, via frames. And in this case, we chose the, the frames in a certain specific way to represent the idea that we have no other influence 
than the curvature of, of, of our manifold. Um, so I hope that that uh, if you take this this uh, this message from from this whole construction, I think we are already quite quite somewhere. And now the idea is, of course, that we can do the same with um, with stochastic processes. But the first thing you could then imagine is that, for example, if you look at Brownian motion, Brownian motion is a very wild uh, wild trajectory in a way. So it's by no means differentiable nowhere. Uh, but then what we can do is we can say, and, and that's called Malia-Vance transfer principle. So he came up with this idea, is that you can replace the, the differential equation by a stochastic differential equation. Uh, and I'm not going to, to go into any details on how you would define stochastic differential equations completely in, in, in manifold, because that would take another uh, uh, quite a while. So uh, for this, I, I have some references in the end, and there's the book of Zoom. It's called Stochastic Analysis in Manifolds, where I think they define it quite clearly. And also this whole construction uh, they define and they, they explain there. And now what you have achieved is that you can start with a, a, a stochastic process in RD, and you can somehow develop it to, or, to a stochastic process on M via this frame bundle. And now you of course say, okay, but then we just start with a Brownian motion in, in RD and see if we can, can obtain in this way a Brownian motion on the manifold. And this is true under some slight modifications that we have to make because um, Brownian motion has, has some properties, namely for one, if we rescale space, then you also rescale the distribution of your process. So you have to kind of be careful there that we are not uh, changing certain lengths. And furthermore, on the other hand, if you do orthogonal transformations, uh, to, uh, if, if you apply orthogonal transformations to Brownian motion, then it actually doesn't change the distribution. So rotating it around the origin or, or, uh, or uh, mirroring it, that doesn't change the distribution of Brownian motion. And now what this kind of leads to is that you want your frames not to be all frames, but just the orthonormal frame. So that means that the basis you take is going to be an orthogonal, an orthonormal basis. Uh, and essentially those maps U with which we represent the frames, those have tend to be isometries. Those, so they have to respect the, the, the length. Uh, and that's also why we need this, uh, where this, this uh, Riemannian metric comes in. Because before, when we only did frames, then nowhere in this construction, we really needed the Riemannian metric. Uh, so it's really, but on the other hand, we use the Laplace Beltrami operator to define Brownian motion in our manifold. So somewhere it of course has to start playing a role that we have this Riemannian metric at hand. And this is exactly where that, where that happens. Um, and now of course you can say, okay, I can bundle all orthonormal frames again together. And then we get what we call the orthonormal frame bundle. And then the result is of, is, of course, luckily that if we start with the Brownian motion in RD and develop it through this whole procedure via the orthonormal frame bundle to M, then we obtain a Riemannian Brownian motion. Uh, and that's, of course, what we were after, that, that we have, in, in a way, a, a geometric construction of, of our Brownian motion. And I want to say a little bit about, uh, about uh, why this is true. So, and this is, this might be very, uh, not, not necessarily easy to follow, but I hope it at least sheds a little bit light on, on, on why this works and, and how they came up with this. So if you look at this stochastic differential equation, so let me go, so at this equation, you can prove if we, if we, if we stick to this realm of, of, of generators that it's generated by a half times this operator. And I write it especially as delta OM because this is often referred to as the horizontal Laplace. And why is this so important? Well, it turns out that this is related very intimately to the Laplace Beltrami operator, namely in the following way. It's in a sense, oh, sorry, it's in a sense the lifted version of the Laplace Beltrami operator. And I mean, this is not necessarily straightforward to prove, and you have to do quite some calculations. 
But you can imagine that if you have such an equation, then uh, you can imagine that the process that you get, which is generated by this, this delta OM, if you would project it down, then you get the process generated by delta by the Laplace Beltrami operator. And then this, this equation really lies at the heart of the proof on, on why this whole, uh, why this procedure works, uh, works this way. Uh, so that's, I think, very, very nice, very important to remember that, that this is somehow something I think they have been working towards that, that to make sure that, that everything fits together well. <coughs> so, um, I think from 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 uh, so, so this is in, in a way how I w also a very nice and interesting way I think to to construct Brownian motion, but also a, a variety of other objects because it's by no means limited to to Brownian motion. Uh, and and now of course now now we have our Brownian motion at hand. Um, I want to to go back to to the large deviation. I think there might still be some some time left i hope uh, yeah yeah you have plenty of time i mean at least uh, 13 more minutes so no no worries at all uh, i don't think i need this so, so that, that's fine that's fine so um just to tell a little bit more about about this about the large deviations and, and how this relates to to the earlier results we have seen so before we saw that that the large deviations for brownian motion uh, are given by, the, or the rate at least of, of those pulse commas was given by the action of, of the trajectory. And there's only one problem with this uh, formulation of the theorem if we want to formulate it for our Riemannian Brownian motion, because we are scaling by, by square root n, or by one over square root n. And of course, this doesn't work in a, in a Riemannian manifold. Um, but then there's a nice thing that uh, in Euclidean space, you can obtain a similar or a process with same distribution if you re rescale time instead. That, that's a property of Brownian motion. And instead of rescaling space by one over square root n, you could just as well rescale time by one over n. <coughs> that's, a, that's an important property of, of, of the Brownian motion. Uh, and now, of course, this you can perfectly well do in a Riemannian manifold. I mean, there are no obstructions at all for this. Um, and then you get, again, uh, the, the large deviations. But now, of course, for this uh, process scaled in time. And you see that the rate function is, again, exactly going to be the action of the trajectory, but now measured with respect to this Riemannian metric. Um, and that's the, in, in a way the natural analog of the result in Euclidean space and, and nothing additional comes by it. It really stays like this. And you can even continue on this. So I haven't necessarily written this down, um, but what I've also been looking at is what happens when the, the Riemannian metric you choose depends on time. So you have kind of an evolving manifold. So you can think of, for example, uh, a sphere which increases in size, but also other kind of objects, as long as, as it deforms over time, um, then it's actually also possible to define a Brownian motion. Uh, but now there is more, it, it becomes a little bit more complicated because you also have to account for this change in Riemannian metrics. And until now, I didn't really use those, those vertical curves and these vertical vectors. But what happens is to, to account for this change in, in Riemannian metric, you have to actually make some adjustments in the frame. If you go from one metric to the other, you have to kind of make, make slight adjust, adjustments to the frame without changing the base point. So that's where also the vertical direction um, comes into play in defining the Brownian motion. But the interesting thing is that if you appropriately rescale the process, in a way similar as done here. You have to be a little bit more careful, but you can do similar things. Then this vertical influence is nowhere to be seen. I mean, the rate function is going to be exactly the same, but then in which, in which norm do we have to uh, evaluate it? Well, the norm of GT. So at, at time T, we have to use GT uh, to evaluate the norm. <coughs> 
And I think that's very interesting to see that, that somehow this whole idea that, that the large deviations of Brownian motion are given by the action of the, uh, of the trajectory stays true at first if you go to Riemannian manifolds and then even if you go to uh, evolving Riemannian manifolds, the, the whole concept um, uh, remains true. And, and, and I think that's quite a remarkable fact. Uh, I mean, at first, uh, it wasn't necessarily obvious immediately that this would be the case. So I think that are very nice results. Um, and furthermore, uh, I've also worked on, on large deviations for these geodesic random walks. Uh, so the analog of, of, of Kramer's theorem, say. And um, this might actually be a, it feels a little bit more complicated than, than to do this for Brownian motion in a way. But uh, also there, you, you really obtain the, the, the analog of, of, of the large deviations you would have in Euclidean space. And I also consider this, this problem in Lie groups, where the, 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 the additional group structure, for one, gives you a slightly easier way to define random walks because, because you can just multiply Lie group elements together. Um, and uh, it actually gives you similar results, but there are cases in which the random walks you would define in Lie groups by, by multiplying elements of the Lie group actually are not of the form of a geodesic random walk with respect to a Riemannian metric you would put on it. So it really also, on top of that, adds new results to, to study this group structure. Uh, and finally, I showed you this, this equality that linked the Laplacian on, on, on OM on, on the orthonormal frame bundle to the Laplacian, so to the laplace Beltrami operator. Um, we, uh, also, together with Frank Redig, I've actually been working on uh, a way of understanding this equality uh, in a probabilistic way. And we actually managed to, to come close to showing that we have also an invariance principle on this frame, on this orthonormal frame bundle. So somehow, you can lift geodesic random walks also to this frame, to this orthonormal frame bundle. And then you can prove that this actually converges to the, the lift version of, of Brownian motion without uh, uh, using the fact that you already kind of know before and that, that this has to happen because we know that um, the process generated by this, this delta OM actually is the, the, the lift of the Brownian motion. So, so it, it, we, we really use it to give a new proof of this fact. And I think that, that's also very interesting. Um, now, finally, there are, of course, plenty of, of directions you can go from here. Uh, and for me uh, specifically, uh, I would also be interested to see how the large deviations work for random walks in evolving manifolds. So, so I did actually the... Um, uh, so we did the, the large deviations uh, for Brownian motion in evolving manifolds, but haven't looked at the, the, the random walk part yet. So I know there is also uh, an invariance principle. Uh, so, so this, this uh, gives at least the, the, the candidate random walk you would have to study. Um, but uh, it still requires some effort, I think, to, to look into that. Um, but also you can add drift to the process. So a drift on a manifold I see as a, a vector field that, that gives you an additional flow or an additional push to the, to the process. And of course, like I already mentioned, this whole rolling procedure, um, of course, extends to lo a lot more uh, processes. You can, you can in, in general define any type of process in a manifold by saying, okay, it has to be the image of the, the, the Euclidean version after this rolling procedure. Uh, so that, that gives you, a, I think, a wealth of, of other uh, processes to study uh, where you can ask similar questions or, or uh, uh, of, of all, ki all kinds, essentially. And finally, it, it might be possible to go beyond a manifold setting and see what are really the, the structural properties that you need to study uh, such type of random walks. and, and um, and, and how far can you kind of, well, leave your structure and then see what are actually really the, the things that are at the essence of, 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 of the processes that, that make it all still work. Uh, but I haven't stepped in this, this direction at all, but, but it, it crossed the, the discussions every now and then. Uh, so yeah, that, that might also be, be a possibility.
And I think that's that's where I want to kind of, of, of end my talk. So I want to thank you very much uh, for the attention. And finally, I have some, some references here uh, about which I've been talking. So thank you.